Well, hello. I'm uh, Greg Lambrecht, the inventor and founder of Coravin, and uh, we are celebrating Father's Day. And today we are joined by Hugh Atchison, who is not only a renowned chef uh, and restaurateur uh, in the Athens, Atlanta, Georgia area. Um, Five and Ten is one of his restaurants, Empire State South, among others, but also an author, James Beard Award winner, um, and philanthropist through his, uh, his charitable activities. You also are the father of two daughters. I am the father of two sons. So welcome. And uh, what are you drinking? I guess that's the core of the question. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm at the restaurant right now. So I'm just, uh, I grabbed a burgundy, which is uh, Joseph Oyo 2011 Bolde. And it's uh, just a simple vineyarding one, but it's a beautiful wine. I've actually been to the vineyards and just Burgundy mean, means a lot to me. I've been to uh, Burgundy as well. And I, I've got to admit, they're just, uh, they're farmer artists and um, they live in a beautiful place. They're multi-generational. They care about family. Um, it's a, it is gorgeous. You know, if you, there were places you could retire. Uh, that would be one of them. I would, uh, I would definitely agree with that. <laughs> so I have chosen a wine um, from the place where my family is from. So we are Austrians, and, and this is a Weingut Knoll. It's a, it's a Ried, which is um, a specific location within the Wachau, uh, and it's Ried uh, Um It's 2015, and my family grows Grunewaldliner. Uh, just outside of Vienna. So uh, I thought I would celebrate this to uh, celebrate Father's Day. I think that's a good celebration. Gruner is always a celebration. Doesn't doesn't matter the day. <laughs> exactly. And it's, it's morning time for those that don't know. So there are certain wines that are really good for the morning. And uh, so we're going to pour ourselves a, a couple of glasses and I get to ask you some questions and you'll be able to ask me some questions. So... Um, have you brought your daughters to Burgundy? I have. Yeah, we were there. Um, we were there for about two weeks, two years ago, and they. We stayed just outside of Bone, in a tiny little town, and rented with about ten friends this house with all these little outbuildings, and they made us breakfast every day. But then the great thing was we'd go to the fancier restaurants for lunch. And then I would go to the market and we'd have these big feasts at night, drinking really fun, inexpensive Beaujolais, uh, Magnum, and just hanging out. And, you know, my kids are pretty progressive. They're, they're like 16 and 18 now, but in France, you know, you let them drink a little bit of wine here and there. And they, they had just a blast. So what have you been doing over these last couple of months? What's, what's filled your days during... Uh, the pandemic and the social isolation. I mean, running so many restaurants, I can't imagine how complex that has been. Well, we, we shut them all down on the 15th of May of March, the Ides of March. So very brutal, mm. Brutus type day. Um, and then quickly regrouped to figuring out how to do any community meals. So we produce at two of the restaurants, one in Atlanta, one in Athens, we produce between the two, 1,200 meals a day wow. that get delivered to hospitals and housing projects and lower income and Latinx communities. So it's been really good. We're, we're actually funded now by uh, Jose Andres' group. You know, oh, that's Central great. Kitchen, and Jose's an old friend. And it's just been really enlightening to see how we can aid our community and help out where we came with what we do well, which is just cook food. And you know, there's no rush to go back to fine dining right now. We're slowly doing it. We're doing some private functions and uh, figuring it out how systems can be assured for the future. But that requires a lot of HACCP plans and really looking at things closely to make sure that my clientele who is often above 65 years old is really safe and yeah. feels safe. Uh, and that comes from us exhibiting and really clearly defining what we're doing. Are you thinking about um, doing outdoor service? I know most of the states like my own Massachusetts is talking about even shutting down streets to allow restaurants uh, more space. 
uh, to yeah, open up. Yeah, we are blessed because we have a, a huge amount of space inside. And I've got five and 10 where I'm at right now is divided into six main rooms. And it's an old house. Outside, we're re-landscaping and putting pavers down and increasing seating by about 18 people. But that's still totally spaced. I can have 40 people in this restaurant and they can't see each other. Which, wow. So we're, we're in a good position. The ones that are really desperate and are in bad, bad situations is if they've got 40 seats in 1,000 square feet and the economic viability of going down to 20 seats is just not there. And everybody wants to compensate with to-go food or selling merch and stuff like that. But that's a really crowded market right now. And delivery services take a lot of money from uh, off the top. And it's just a difficult, and it's, it's a different, different game. You know, restaurants such a source of sustenance um, that you, you know, you can still make people feel good, even though there's a global pandemic and we're all locked down right, by eating a great meal. So I, I know that the, your, your, your training is French cooking. You're Canadian and uh, from Ottawa, and, and yet you're living in the South, and you've written beautifully about uh, Southern cooking, Southern style cooking, award-winning um, uh, book about Southern cooking. Do you see a thread from, what is the thread that goes from where you started working in restaurants in, in Canada to the French cooking style that you, you mastered to the South and what drew you, what drew you along that path? You know, I think that the important thing is to always cook from the community that's around you and to learn and learn in depth, um, giving it credence and respecting it and understanding it, not just dabbling it. Um, and so living in the Gatineau Mountains in Canada, you see all the producers and the food history there, which is very different. It's very pure. It's very game oriented in local cheeses and amazing small farms. Then you come down to the South and you see this more rustic, beautiful and simple, but tarnished and it's a food out of, hardship <laughs> and it, it's it's hard to come to terms with sometimes and figure out where the beauty in it but it is there but it's it's cooking out of simplicity and it's cooking out of purity and it's cooking very seasonally but it also came here in the pockets of slaves and it's not something that was created in plantation houses by white women it was created by people growing okra behind there who were slaves. So it's, it's a really interesting thing and a lot's been written about it. And so my role is just to give it credence and tell the truth about it. One of the things that you, you've done that I was really impressed with, and I, I wanted to hear where this came from, you, uh, you, you work on uh, seed life skills and founded seed life skills uh, as a charitable organization for, for youth. And, and I wanted to hear your philosophy and what, what got you started with Seed Life Skills and, and, and this whole idea of empowering kids uh, in the way that you do, not to spoil. Yeah, I, I started my organization called Seed Life Skills, which was to build a curriculum for kids that would be taught to them in grade six, seven, eight, kind of based loosely around the old school idea of home economics. Um, and it came into fruition because Beatrice, who's now 18, came home after in first day of sixth grade and had a home economics or what it was called was family and consumer sciences. And I asked her what she made and she said, red velvet cupcakes from a box and then Pillsbury croissants wrapped in bacon. And I was like, ooh, that doesn't sound very healthy. Um, and it's all boxed basic food and processed. And, and so I called the school superintendent who was a friend of mine and he was like, I've got an idea. How about you write the curriculum? And I was like, I don't really have time. But then he was like, no, you should do it. And I was like, okay. Um, so we wrote this really extensive curriculum that's available free online. And it's all built on the premise that if I can teach a kid 12 blocks of technique in food, and then 12 blocks of technique in how to live. 
that if those are routine skill sets and you can build different things with them, then you nourish yourself later on. Mm -hmm. But if you just teach a kid how to make a red velvet cupcake out of a box, you're not actually teaching them a retainable skill. So if I can make a community healthier by teaching people how to make a vinaigrette from scratch, okay, it's a ratio. It's very simple. Sure. You, if you can make a vinaigrette and understand a three to one ratio of oil to acid and a jar, and then you can flavor it with whatever you want, then you never have to go buy store bought. If I can teach kids how to make a salad and appreciate vegetables, I can show them how to make a meal that's far less than a happy meal later on when they've got kids of their own. And if I teach somebody how to roast a chicken and uh, steam vegetables, the, the, these are good stepping stones to equalize a community who's lacking in skill sets because of endemic problems within the world. But it, it was really successful. You know, roast chicken and uh, vinaigrette are just as relevant now as they are five years ago as they are 30 years ago. So um, I think that's a beautiful... Probably even more. Yeah, maybe even more. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to sort of end our discussion talking about fatherhood. Um, I mean, it's such a complicated concept. <laughs> it seems really easy in the beginning, and then there's so much that's involved in it, right? You're, you're trying to balance your work life. You're trying to balance your family life. What does being a father mean to you? I mean, if you could summarize for it. It's maybe it's too well, it's just To me, it's just been amazing. And watching two people grow up and mature in front of your eyes and just become amazingly empathetic humans and it you know with but still their their own personalities and they're driven in their own ways i think that parenthood needs to be always looked at as i've learned probably just as much from rearing them and 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 being a parent than i've ever taught them and so it's made me a much better person and it's just it had me grown a lot and then we've, we've come through a lot together as, as parents and children, and, but we need to celebrate that and, and revel in it. Yeah, well, you know, I gotta say, um, celebrating Father's Day with you has been uh, a true joy. Um, you've almost moved me to tears twice, and, and, uh, and, uh, and you've made me hungry the entire time. <laughs> uh, thank you for this morning and cheers. Uh, happy Father's done. Cheers, Day. Greg. Yeah, cheers. Happy, Happy Father's, Father's Day. Day. Yeah.